Hey folks, I'm assuming that you have already watched the last video, which is hybridization and sigma and pi bonds. So you need to have that introduction to jump into this one. Um, so here we have a picture showing different bonds and I want you to pause this video and attempt to draw these as a Lewis dot structure and see if you get the right answer. See if you understand what all the symbols, the colors mean. Okay, so the correct answer is going to be, I'm going to start with carbon. So we'll put carbon in the middle. We have a sigma bond to a hydrogen that's kind of arranged in the back. And we have a sigma bond to this hydrogen. So those will be just, just single bonds. And then I have a sigma bond to an oxygen. The oxygen has four unbonded electrons on it. And then I have this pink pi bond on the top and the bottom. That means there's a double bond between the carbon and the oxygen. And that will also complete the octet for both carbon and oxygen. So this is formaldehyde, which uh, is used in a lot of places. Your liver makes it as part of the metabolic process in small amounts, but it's also used um, in biology and medicine and stuff like that for fixing tissues. Um, not fixing like repairing, fixing like drying them up so they don't decompose. Uh, this is in large doses not very good for you, but like I said, your body produces it, so it's okay. Um, in, in small amounts from your body. It's what you get, it's one of the reasons that you get a hangover, okay? Your body takes alcohol and turns it into formaldehyde. But this is the molecular orbital picture of formaldehyde, okay? The hybridization at the carbon would be, it's got four domains involved, but, I'm sorry, it's got three domains involved. Look at the purples. And so we would call that sp2 hybridized, right? Okay. So another example here is going to be acetylene. So acetylene is used in welding and also used on our AAS that you used for silver solder. So acetylene begins by taking the sp hybrid orbital and connecting to make a sigma bond between the two carbons. Then it's going to take both the vertical p orbital and the horizontal p orbital and make those into double bonds as well. So you end up with a c with a sigma here, a pi that's on the top and the bottom, and another pi in the back and the front. Okay, so this is very crowded. You can see why there is only going to be up to triple bonds. You can't fit another pair of, well, there aren't any more p orbitals to use for a pi bond, but if there were, you couldn't fit them anywhere around there. It'd be too full. All right, so this is going to be sp hybridized because each carbon has two domains, one between the carbons and one between carbon and hydrogen. Okay, and so this is why we have a limit to how many electrons can be in, in double and triple bonds, okay? We can't fit anymore. There's no quadruple bond. There's just not enough space. There's not enough p orbitals either because one orbital is involved in the sigma bond and then the other two p orbitals are making the double or triple. So we talked before about resonance and about how um, it just means you're moving double bonds around. And you might also do triple bonds as well. For our purposes, any pi electrons can be resonance, part of your delocalized structure. Delocalized meaning shared across the larger area of the molecule. So here we have nitrate. There's one double bond, but because each atom bonded to the N is the same thing, we can put the double bond in between any of these oxygens and nitrogens, which means that each Lewis structure is like a snapshot in time. And if you took multiple pictures, you will find that the double bond will resonate between all three positions. This makes things particularly stable. Resonance is a good thing. It's kind of like if I could share my bills with two other families, that would be great, right? So electrons are a burden and they're repelling each other. 
So if you can share those pi electrons across the whole molecule, that makes it more stable. Okay, so here is what we would call a localized pi orbital just between the 1n and 1o. This is not an accurate depiction of what we measure because this would have a shorter bond than the other NOs do because they just have singles in this drawing and this one has a double. In reality, we measure the exact same bond distance just like we saw for ozone before, which means that these pi electrons must bounce from one to the other. And that makes sense because these balloons, these p orbitals here, are all in the same plane and they're not very far off. So the electrons do move between all of those locations. Another look at benzene again. So benzene has six carbons and six hydrogens with sigma bonds. And then it has these p orbitals at each carbon that just smash together to make a resonance structure where the electrons, the six um, double bond electrons can exist anywhere in the ring. All right, and so that would look like this. Sometimes you will see benzene drawn as a, he a hexagon because, you know, six carbons, each point meaning there's a carbon there. And then you'll see the ring in the middle. That ring is to show that the electrons, the three double bonds, are all around the entire molecule, not just in one spot. So they're delocalized. Again, that makes it more stable. It means benzene requires more energy to break it apart than if we didn't have the delocalization. So a lot of the time I get the question, is resonance actually important? And the answer is absolutely. So benzene is a fuel additive in uh, some types of uh, gasoline. Um, it's also used a lot of other places like your hormones, your body, all over the place um, because it is so stable. In addition to benzene resonance, you'll see um, sulfate and phosphate. We looked at the resonance structure of sulfate when we were talking about the Lewis dot structures, but sulfate and phosphate both do this, and they are the backbone of many things in our, in our, in our bodies. So just to, just to illustrate this, um, a generic wiki page about um, molecular biology, which is the study of chemistry in biological systems, um, I highlighted this right here because it specifically, this random website specifically mentions how important resonance forms are to the way that proteins function. So quite often we'll find that one shape, one resonance structure will allow a protein to function and a different resonance structure will turn it off. It's really subtle changes. Just moving a few electrons around will do that. All right, and so um, it's, it's applicable all over biology especially but also in material science when you start manufacturing polymers and other complicated molecules, large molecules. Okay, so just kind of summarizing some of the stuff we already talked about. Um, now we're gonna apply it to another model. So, so far we are talking about hybridization. Hybridization is the next stepping stone to understanding molecular orbital theory or MO theory. MO theory explains why some atoms will combine to make molecules and others won't, all right? So I already mentioned you can have constructive and destructive interference. Um, when we draw MO diagrams, we will see that constructive interference means lower in energy and destructive interference means higher in energy. We can tell when, when atoms are stable using MO theory because you will have more constructive interference than destructive interference. Um, I moved those slides back to the end where they belong. So to resume our conversation about MO theory, what, what it's based on again is the idea that we have those same atomic orbitals from chapter six. And when we add when we hybridize them, it's not adding. It keeps saying that, but it's wrong. When we hybridize them, we will have some areas where overlap is constructive. That means energy goes down. So here we show a sigma orbital from the 1s 
atomic orbital. So this is a molecular orbital. And we're saying where it comes from with the subscript. On the other hand, we also have destructive interference, which means that the electrons don't go in between the two nuclei. So it's what we call an anti-bond. Right? So anti-bonding on the top and bonding on the bottom. And in short, if you have more electrons in the bonding orbitals than in the anti-bonding orbitals, the molecule will be stable. So we take hydrogen and you'll notice that we have the atomic orbitals just like our, you know, if we covered up So if we cover up the atom, the molecular orbital part, we can see that this diagram should be familiar to us. It's an alphabet diagram from chapter eight. All right, so we put an alphabet diagram on the left side for hydrogen, and the other atom I'm bonding to will go on the right side, which in this case is just two hydrogens. We're doing H2. So. We'll put one alpha bow on the left for, for H, which just has one electron in the 1s orbital. And then we have the second atomic orbital on the right side. In the middle is where the molecular orbitals go. Okay, so one goes down in energy, that's our constructive interference, and one goes up in energy. Each of these boxes can still hold two total electrons. That's because the ones they come from have a space for four. So you could normally fit two in this 1s box and two in the 2s box. When they come together as H2, we end up with a molecular orbital that has two electrons in the sigma 1s. So that's what we have noted here. So sigma tells you the kind of bond. 1s tells you what atomic orbital it came from, and the, the superscript of 2 lets us know how many electrons are there. So this is the shorthand um, written way of showing the entire diagram. You'll notice that when we have destructive interference, we use this asterisk to show the anti-bonding levels. Okay, you'll do that in the shorthand notation as well if we had any electrons there, which we don't yet. So um, it's important to know, so here's your rules, right? It's important to know that depending which part of period two in the P block you're looking at, we have a different order for our orbitals, okay? So what we're gonna see is the difference happens right here. So everything is the same up until that point. For oxygen, fluorine, and neon, so the right side of uh, period two in the P block, the sigma orbital, sigma 2P, comes before pi 2P. For the left side, so carbon, nitrogen, and boron, it's the other way. The pi 2P comes before the sigma 2P. Okay, so use your periodic table to help you remember that. I do not expect you to be able to memorize these orders. I am giving you this as a reference for your work, okay? I don't think it's important for you to be able to draw an empty diagram, but if you have it, you should be able to fill it in like this. So you can pause the video, try it out for oxygen, and see what, what happens. So we have a total of six valence electrons for each oxygen, so we'll have 12 valence total. I have not drawn in the core electrons on this diagram because if I did, they would be like in my basement, right? They would have a really big gap in energy between the 1s and the 2s. So it's just not included in this diagram to keep it simpler, okay? So we have 12 total electrons in the entire molecular structure. That's the middle part, the molecular orbital. For the atomic orbitals, so again, those are the ones on the outside. Atomic is on the outsides, and the molecular orbital comes together in the middle. Okay. 
So this is our electron configuration from chapter six. I'm gonna only fill in the valence electrons in my atomic orbitals. So 1s2, and I have 2p4. So remember, they're gonna spread out and point in the same direction before they pair up. Same thing on this side. Okay. When they form a molecule, we are going to fill up with all 12 of those electrons from the bottom, working our way up. So same principle here. Each line represents a box, and so we'll just fit two electrons on each line. So if we stopped here, if we only had a total of four electrons, this would not be a molecule that could possibly form because it has the same number of bonding and antibonding electrons. But we're not done yet. We're, that's only four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So we're out of electrons. That's it. We just go all the way up. You'll notice I didn't pair these up because, again, Hun's rule still applies. We have to spread them out and point them in the same direction. So the bond order is how to figure out whether the molecule will form or not. And so essentially, we just add up bonding minus antibonding and divide that by two. And that will tell us how many bonds are in the molecule. If this answer is zero, then it's not stable. If it's anything above zero, then the molecule can form, even if it's a half. Like sometimes people see one and a half and they think that means it can't happen. Um, that's not, that's not actually what that means. Okay, so we're gonna, I'm gonna circle the bonding orbitals in green. So what I'm looking for when I do this is if there are any stars, right? So the ones that go down in energy don't have stars, they are bonding. So I end up with two, four, six, eight bonding electrons here. And I'm gonna circle my non, my anti-bonding rather, my anti-bonding electrons in black. So I end up with four of those. So you can see eight minus four is four, that in oxygen, we predict a double bond. A double bond will have one sigma and it will have one pi bond, okay? So our pi bond is here, I wrote over it, but this is a pi bond because there's two spots. One of these is being canceled out, but that still leaves one pi bond behind and one sigma behind that isn't canceled out. That's what a double bond means. So molecular orbital theory is beautiful because instead of just guessing Lewis dot structures, which is what we had before MO was invented, we are able to definitively state that oxygen always has a sigma bond and a pi bond, so it will always have a double bond, okay? So you can use this for any diatomic molecule, so O2, N2, H2, all of those, C2, any of them. It's the same idea. You fill in your atomics on the left and the right, and then you use that same number of electrons to fill up from the bottom up, remembering that electrons will separate when they can. The last and really neatest thing, I think, is we can also explain magnetism better this way than we can with just atomic orbitals because this is a molecule. Did you know that molecules can be magnetic? Yeah, they absolutely can. So what I mean by that is uh, if we have any unpaired electrons in the structure, then you will have magnetic character in it. And so if you did the MO diagram for water, you would find uh, that there are unpaired electrons and that means water is magnetic. If you've never tried it, turn on a thin stream of water in a faucet and put a strong magnet next to it or even just a balloon that you rub on your head and it will bend the column of the water as long as the water is not moving too fast. So that's proof of one piece of evidence that molecular orbital theory is pretty good at explaining the behavior of molecules. So this, this diagram is an empty one that you can use to answer this question for neon. It's a good idea to print it out if you can. It's easier to write it or to save it as an image. Um, and you can fill in your electrons that way. 
How come neon 2 doesn't exist? NE2? Well, fill in this and do a bond order calculation and you can find out for yourself. Okay. So this is our summary of what we just did. I've noted here that if you get a bond order of one, it means a single bond, a two is double, and three is triple, but it is also possible to get one and a half or two and a half. That would mean there is resonance between, so if you get one and a half, oops, if you get one and a half, it means there's resonance between a single bond. I've got to fix that. I didn't write single. There's resonance between a single bond and a double bond formation. So not only can molecular orbital theory tell us whether molecules exist, it also tells us what kinds of bonds they can have and whether there's resonance. It's a really powerful tool instead of just kind of guessing and then measuring and hoping we were guessing correctly.